Eucadia. Eucadia. Three, let it be known that the deed of facts and interrogatory is also known as factum verum et rogatire mandamus, annexed here to in full, makes clear the factual evidence that trust recipient number blah, 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 through their above mentioned high office has permitted the deliberate injury of trust recipient number, so on, also known by the, the form of whomever, as specified by the deed. So that's where we annex the deed of facts and interrogatories as one. Let it be known that trust recipient number, so on, is hereby requested to make remedy available to trust recipient number, whomever, also known by the form of, whatever the name is, as specified by the deed within 14 days of receipt of this writ, should the member fail to respond or make good their remedy within this time, then their unanswered interrogatories shall be published as a solemn confession for all to witness their extreme dishonour and contempt. And what do we mean by solemn confession? Well, let me, let me give you an example of a solemn confession. My people have written liens and they've written bills and, you know, we've gone down the road of being naughty people and we issue, as we do with deed polls, dishonours and protests and all this sort of stuff. But what is something permanent for all history that is an absolute dishonour and shame? If you don't answer any interrogatories by law, it's a maximum of law, then you confess. That, in fact, is Roman cult canon law. So, what would the solemn confession of uh, President Barack Hussein Obama sound a bit like? Now, I'm just going to give you some off-the-cuff example. It may be something like this. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly confess and declare that I am incompetent and incapable of holding office and that any orders that shall be given by me are through nothing but force, fear and ignorance. Okay, you get the drift? Let's say they don't answer three great wits. I, Barack Hussein Obama, for the third time declare myself incompetent and incapable of holding office. Now, I know that we're dealing with people who are dangerous, who have trained their own minions as robots, and who are not permitted to think, and are image trained to knee jerk and jump. I understand all that. But we are in a matter of history. A system, an unlawful system, pervades the world. The world is ruled by regimes and force, and fear, and ignorance. There are very few entities that remain in honour at all at this present moment. And history will be our judge as we move forward. So then we finally leave by, let it be known to one and all before heaven and earth that this solemn, sacred, irrevocable uh, writ is lawfully promulgated in good faith and honour with all facts carefully considered and with the greatest of respect. Now, that is crucial at the end because if you issue a writ that is not valid, if you issue a writ before you have gone through the EDP process, if you simply say, to hell with it, I will do with it what I like, you are in a fundamental breach and you are no better in fact, you are worse than the person you are issuing to. And that phrase is letting them know that if anyone was to issue a writ for the hell of it, because I think it's funny, and we'll see if it works, it lets them know that the full force of, of, of what law exists on our side and the full fear and mechanics that they have can be brought to bear. So be very very careful with these tools. These are not games. These are very powerful instruments that are being used in history. And please consider honour. Please. Now, I've run a bit over time now. I have run over quite a bit over time. I'll leave it at that. 
I thank you, and I'm sorry that it was so forceful tonight on a number of things, but these are pressing times. And I know many of you are under pressure, and I know that hopefully a number of these things are timely for you. So open to questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. Um, just as a reminder for callers on the phone lines, if you will press star 8 on your phone, we'll get into the question and answer queue. All right, from the uh, chat, we have some questions here, Frank. Uh, who judges whether one is competent? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, we have some canons that give some definition of competence. And um, I might quickly go in there and have a quick look at some of those because I can't remember them from memory. But the short answer is uh, any courts will determine competence uh, and the courts that we're dealing with with private courts will play a trick. They don't want you to be competent. And competence is really uh, determined by the definition. There is a test for competence. So in our case, when I call up competence, uh, where are we? Competence, competence. Uh, I'm getting there. That's consent. One sec. One sec. Here we go. Article 176 of Positive Law, Competency. Um, we define, I think, the answer to um, who determines, the law determines competence. That's the first thing. Um, a, a judge may test for competence, but ultimately it's the law that determines who is or is not competent. And in Canon 1813, Competence is a fiction concept of being fit, proper and qualified to produce and argue reason through knowledge and skill of law, logic and rhetoric against opposing arguments. Therefore, a man or woman cannot claim competence without demonstrating skill at reason, argument and knowledge and suitable qualification. Okay, so th th that's the answer. The law determines the qualities by which one is tested for competence. That's the answer. Well, I may be uh, making an assumption here, but it uh, uh, seems that the question was pointed more towards um, determining competence, um, competency within Eucadia. Well, that's what I've just answered. There are a series of canons that determine the test of competence. Now, uh, if, you, if you are asking, for example, let's take the, the definition of um, can demonstrate reason logic and, and rhetoric. So if someone in a chat uh, responds with the claim, uh, this is all rubbish, this is all crap, is that a reasonable comment? Is that the comment of reason? No, it's not. It's rudeness, isn't it? It's, it's unreasonable. So if someone is behaving unreasonably and is being a bully and is being angry and aggressive, they are demonstrating qualities that are inconsistent with competency in accordance with these canons without anyone having to run you through a, a special test to say uh, I've arbitrarily decided that you are incompetent. No one should be doing that uh, and if you feel that you have been um, uh, unfairly judged, please read these canons again and, and if you feel that, uh, that you are still unfairly uh, judged, then obviously we'll look at some remedy because remedy is built in at every level of UKDA. That's why I started tonight's chat by talking about those issues. Does that answer it, Terry, do you think? Yes, I think so. Thank you, Frank. Uh, next question. Uh, it is suggested to send an EDP upon every presentment. Are we to do this registered mail and why not certified uh, mail to print and print out the uh, confirmation. I know we've covered it several several times, but maybe not in depth is the difference between registered and certified mail. Well, it's actually a good question now. The, the, the short answer is it doesn't matter anymore because they don't sign the green notices, they don't sign the certificates, they don't follow their own procedure. That's over. It's stopped. The Postal Service is being deliberately uh, disassembled around the world and the, the International Postal Union is in fact a private system like the Bank for International Settlement but it did provide for some time uh, an excellent form of uh, registration notice into their system. Right now there's, 
there's virtually no benefit in going the whole hog or low because they don't recognise that the high, they don't recognise it any. So I would simply say to you, providing you can show that there was some form of registered post, there's no point in going the whole hog because this, the system doesn't follow its procedures anymore. What do you think, Terry? I mean, you know this as much as I do. Yeah, they're not following their... Yeah, that's true. The green cards may or may not come back or the even online, what we're noticing is that the Postal Service is not doing a confirmation that it was received when it actually was. There's a lot of different things happening. So uh, that's true. All right, uh, next question. Do we need to write a document to attest to the trust? Or like we have, you and I have discussed the Articles of Existence? Yes. Well, the, 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 um, you don't need it for Eucadia because the covenant is your trustee. The, the, the covenant, amongst many things it is, it is the deed of trust of your trust. However, in their system, sending them a copy of the covenant would freak out most people and, and their usual response is pretty straightforward. They just say, I don't understand, deny it. So there is, in fact, a, a version of a deed of trust that is up that can be downloaded under ecclesiastical deed poll notes. However, there is a work team of which Terry is is part of that that's looking at the review and revision of that as we speak, and there will be an updated version. And there is a uh, there is a, a relevant aspect to that in that the name of the deed of trust may well, it will, not may, it will reflect the updates that we're also doing with the EIN number where we assert our claim of right for our name. So instead of the deed of trust being for trust number blah, 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 it'll be the Frank O'Collins Trust, yeah, deed of trust. So hopefully that answers the question. But you can go and see it now. You can go and download the version now. I think that helps. Um, now, along with those same lines uh, for that type of document, do we have to specify who the grantor, trustee, and beneficiaries are? Uh, they are defined in the deed of trust, yes. Uh, now I want to answer that question as to what is needed for opening up the, the uh, bank account, as we discussed, the, um, the basic information that show articles of existence that Tell to the grantor, trustee, and the location. Absolutely. Uh, now, look, yeah, it, it's a good question. And, and, and um, again, please forgive the fact that this is an evolving process, but, but I hope you understand that we've come from a position where we're doing everything possible right, and yet we are, we're not being sticks in the mud in terms of saying that uh, anyone is left out to, to dry. Um, so just as we are refining the EIN and just as we are refining the deed of trust, we're also refining the kind of material and the most practical and pragmatic system of the banks. Look, we put in the system that the ideal bank account is a special deposit account. <clears throat> the reason we put that in there is that under a special deposit account, uh, by, by its rules, a bank cannot touch and an external entity cannot touch the assets. Now this is true. However, if they want to steal money, they steal money and it's still a bank in their system and of course as we see they can pretty much and have been doing whatever they like. The problem in going to banks and asking for a special deposit and we now have enough evidence to prove this is true is that if you finally get with someone that says all right we will open up a special deposit. You need $5 million. That's what we're finding. Now, the purpose of doing this was not to waste anyone's time, and its purpose was as an act of necessity because we are building and turning on our reserve banks and the banks that will be reserve banks at a local level and supporting and underpinning the currencies on the thousands and thousands of currencies that have been established around the world 
as alternative.